Hello, my name is Maura Keating and I work for the Irish Childhood Brief and Network. ICBN is a support network. It works with members to promote the voice of bereaved children and young people, recognising that theirs has traditionally been the silent voice of grieving. We're hosted by the Irish Hospice Foundation and we're funded through TUSA. And we have an advisory group that help guide us through our work and they're made up of representatives from bereavement services nationally. Our main aims are to support professionals to deliver high quality bereavement services, to respond on signposts and um, bereavement queries from families and carers, to provide information for the public around issues in relation to childhood loss and to try and advocate for bereaved children and young people through influencing policy and decision making in Ireland and to generate new ideas and approaches to help enhance the capacity within the sector. I'm talking to you today because we're every November we raise awareness around bereaved children and as members of staff within the family resource centres I'm very conscious that you're frontline working with families on a day-to-day -day basis and the issues of bereavement and loss come up both from an adult and a child perspective. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time just sharing with you some information that we use in understanding how children grieve um, and the different ways in which as adults we can respond to them to help them express their emotions around grief. But just before we go into it, I just want to acknowledge that, you know, talking about this subject can be very difficult. It can tap into our own emotions, it can tap into our own feelings and concerns and worries. Um, and that grief by nature is a very hard and lonely thing. It's a very individual thing. So if as a person, as a human being, as a worker in a family resource center, you're affected by this grief, don't be afraid to reach out and get some support for yourself. So basically, just to acknowledge, I suppose, when someone dies, it is, it is human nature, it's natural almost to not know what to do or say. Um, it's hard to talk about these things. Um, sometimes we don't even know how we're supposed to feel. When we're personally affected, it can be incredibly overwhelming, um, but there's no right or wrong feelings in relation to grief. There's no map, there's no stages, there's no schedule. It's an individual experience. We all experience it differently. Um, or any of you who've been through a loss recently will even recognize that within your own family members, you all approach it quite differently. So grief does what, what it wants effectively. It takes over you in different ways um, and it doesn't follow any rules or schedule. So from a children's perspective, they really express grief quite differently. Um, and sometimes they need adults to help them find their way and find ways to express that. As adults, we instinctively want to protect children. We naturally would never really want to be exposing children to pain or hurt or upset. But the reality is when the, someone close to them or a loved one has died, there's nothing we can do about it. We can't fix what's happened. We can't reverse it. All we can do is try and help them understand what they're feeling and give them ways to express their feelings and give them lots of reassurance. So as you know well, death can be very frightening, particularly for very young children, but even for adolescents, death is a frightening thing. And they need a lot of information to help them understand what's going on. Unlike adults, children tend to dip in and out of their grief. Um, they, you'll see what will happen is one day they might be very quiet, very low or upset. And then within a half an hour, they could be off plane and seem as if they're absolutely fine. That's kind of, some, some people call that puddle jumping through grief or dipping in and out of grief. I like to think that children have an innate natural instinct to play. And they know that this stuff is too hard to deal with all the time. It's too hard to think about and carry all the time. So I want to do something that makes me feel better. So even though I still am upset about the person that has died, I want to play with my friends. I want to be with my friends. I want to pretend everything is normal. 
And that's like a little safety valve they have built in. Um, and I think sometimes as adults, we could learn a lot from that. So as an adult in a family resource center, supporting bereaved children or family, or, or even talking to a parent who's trying to support their own children, it's always good to encourage them to talk and to be as honest and as open as you can about the information, no matter how hard it is. Children respect honesty, they prefer to be told the truth. Obviously, you're gonna to have to break it down into language that they understand, and you're gonna to have to break it down by age and stage. And I'm gonna talk about a little bit that further on. Um, but it's really important as adults for us to acknowledge the child's feelings and to encourage them to ask questions. And even if they don't want to talk about it, it's not putting them under any pressure to talk, but letting them know that you're there for them um, and that you can talk to them if they, if they, if and when they choose to. So reassuring them and also be prepared to keep repeating the information because they can't really, especially younger children, they can't get their heads around what's actually happening. It's too much to take in. So a lot of reassurance and repetition, repeating some of the things in different ways so that they can actually absorb it and it can really sink in. It helps them process what's happened and their grief and their emotions around it. So basically explaining them in whatever way they need to hear it. Um, again, young children and adolescents particularly, they don't want a big long lecture about this, but they want to be told the truth and they, they want their questions answered. So be led by their questions. If they ask questions, be led by their questions and don't be afraid to answer them. And if you don't have the answers, that's fine as well. You just say, that's a really good question. Let me think about that and we, 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 I'll come back to you and then come back to them. And if, it, if needs be, talk to another colleague. You can talk to us and get a bit of guidance on how to respond. But don't be afraid to talk to answer the questions. If they're asking the questions, they want to know the answer. So I'm going to talk through the next few slides, breaking it down by age, children's understanding of death and some of the reactions you might see. Um, and you'll recognize some of this stuff uh, in, from your work on a day-to-day -day basis with children in the family resource centers. So very young children, you know, sort of from two and younger and babies, obviously they don't cognitively understand um, what, what death is and they don't understand that it's final, but they do feel the absence of somebody, uh, particularly if it was somebody close and they will feel the absence and they will sense the change in the family and the upset in the family. So they will sense that. Um, but if with that age group, it's really important to maintain the routine. I suppose it's important to, with all age groups to maintain the routine, but particularly with the very young ones to maintain the routine, because once they're, they get their, their basic needs met and they're nurtured, um, then they, the anxiety around what's happening and the absence uh, will be soothed. Um, but they may appear more clingy, a bit more distressed. They obviously won't have the words to express it. Um, they might have mad outbursts of crying or get a bit withdrawn or um, lots and lots of angry tears. So that age group, even though we often think, oh, they, they don't understand it, they do feel it. So um, and as they mature and as they get older, they'll, they'll feel it in different ways. Um, and you will have to maybe, you know, children who had a bereavement when they were very young that only know about it from what they've been told and don't remember it will have emotional feelings about it as they mature. And I'll come back to that later. Um, then the children in the sort of preschool age group, um, again, they don't understand that death is final. They don't understand that this person is gone forever. Um, and they may sort of get into searching behavior. They might start looking for the person or they may start thinking that, it, it, you know, OK, they're, they're dead, but they don't understand what dead means. Um, and using the word dead is really important. Using a lot of adults feel that we if we soften the words and say things like they've they've passed away or they're gone or we we've lost grandma or um, they've gone to another a better place. That actually 
we think we're protecting children by using those soft words, but actually what happens is that can cause a lot more confusion in the child's mind because if they think the person is lost, they, they'll go, well, let's go look for them. If they think they've gone to a better place, well, why can't we all go to this lovely place if it's a lovely, better place? You know, so it can all cause more confusion and they may not articulate what's confusing them, but it's in their head. So using the words like dead and, de and death are important. The body has died um, they, they they look like they're asleep, but they will never wake up again. Um, now, they won't really understand at this early age that it's final. But what you're doing is you're setting the seed for their understanding as they mature um, and you're helping it be less confusing for them. Um, but at this age as well, they may show signs of aggression um, and they may have lots of different intense emotions. Um, and that regression is normal. Um, they just need a bit of space, a bit of time, a bit of nurturing and a bit of support, keeping and establishing the relationships and the routine as best as possible. Um, in some family circumstances, a lot happens. There's a lot of other stressors in the family and a lot happens when there's been a death and there's a lot of upheaval. So it's hard to keep routine and normal, but as best you, they can, as best can be, keep routine and normal. And that might be, um, in your case, in the Family Resource Centre, the children attending the services that they had always attended, being with the same caregivers, being with the same group of children, you know, that might be the most stable thing in their lives at this time of a bereavement. Um, so, uh, you know, you can play an enormous uh, comforting role. Moving on to the sort of four to six age group when they're moving into the early stages of, of primary school um, you know their move their, their their language has developed their autonomy in the world has developed they're more concrete and challenging in their questions at this age and um, they still aren't fully uh, able to completely understand the complexity of death and the meaning of death and the finality of death but um, they are they are able to understand a little bit more and they certainly will have more questions and they will need to be to be given more information. Um, they're, as you know well, they're in that magical thinking stage. So very often they will, um, in their heads, they will get fantasies about if I'm really, really good, um, uh, maybe if I ask Santa, the person, their loved one, will can come back for Christmas or for their birthday. They often wish and think those things because they still believe that. On the reverse of that, sometimes because of the magical thinking, they, um, you know, they can worry that maybe it's something they did. Maybe because they hadn't been very good or they had had, a, you know, thrown a tantrum or had an argument or hadn't done what they were supposed to do, um, that that has caused the death. And again, all these thoughts can be confusing in their heads. Sometimes they will not articulate it. They will not get the words out. Sometimes they are afraid to say those words or sometimes they don't have the words. So as adults, we can help them express it by trying to have little conversations with them and asking them to talk about what their worries are and what their concerns are. Asking them to tell you in their, in their own words, what do they understand has happened? And when you hear them telling you back the story, that will help you see how much they're understanding and whether or not they're getting confused about things, whether or not they have little worries or concerns because they've misinterpreted something that has been said. And even if the children haven't been, aren't in a family or in an environment where there's a culture of being open and talking and sharing the information, they will hear things. They will pick up things and they will have little ideas in their heads about what, why this has happened, what's going on. So they will have worries and concerns. Um, so we, whether you talk to them or don't talk to them, these issues will go on. But it is far better to have this open, honest dialogue. And as staff and, and support workers in the family resource centres, I think you could play a really good role in helping the parents 
to understand how important it is for them to have open conversations with their children. And I know it's incredibly hard because they're likely to be immersed in their own grief as well, but it's better that they do talk to children and explain things to them and let the children know that they can come and ask questions if they have worries or concerns. Um, so moving on then in, in the kind of the older, the sort of seven to 11, the sort of second half of primary school, just about to go into secondary school, um, they're moving into the stage where they understand what this means. Um, now, depends on the child, some of them, you know, will, will hold on to that, uh, that magical thinking for a lot longer. Um, um, but they will, they'll, 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 they'll be in tune with that this death means this person is gone and gone forever. And they will have lots of worries and concerns. Um, and they may fall into all sorts of different uh, scenarios in the way that they respond. They're eating, they're sleeping, maybe disturbed. That's completely normal. They may withdraw from friends and families. All of that is normal in the initial stages and they need a bit of space and a bit of time to do that. Or they may not want to talk about it or pretend that it hasn't happened and just go and play with their friends and not want anybody to mention it. Um, so all of those things are normal enough um, and they need, I suppose at that age, um, sometimes they need to be given space to, to express themselves other than through angry outbursts because even if a child doesn't want to talk it doesn't mean they can't have ways to express or get a bit of support it might just be that as their sort of person their key worker or the person that they link with very well in in the in the center that you just give them a little silent nod and say i'm here for you you know if you ever want to talk to me knowing that they have somebody that they can come to or letting them know that some of these feelings can be very overwhelming and if you ever feel like you really need to get your get have an outburst come and talk to me and we, we'll, we'll figure something out um and again going back to answering the questions if they're asking questions particularly at this age they want to know the answers they have worries and concerns in their head they want to know the answers so answer their questions and um, if you can or encourage the parents um, to answer their questions. When we move into the adolescent stage we're obviously moving into a stage where there's a more um, adult response and understanding of grief however it is more complex time as we know because there's all sorts of other issues going on in adolescence and then Adolescence is a wide range. You go from 13 to 18 and it's very, you know, it's a very wide list. Um, uh, but I think with adolescence, it's very much a personal uh, reaction. And I think we really have to be very respectful of their personal reaction and give them space um, to respond in, and, and to talk if they want to talk or not talk if they want to talk. Um, I spoke to three young people from the one family who all went back to um, the same secondary school after their dad died. Um, one was just starting, it was his first year in the school. The other was in junior cert and the other was in leaving cert. And each of them wanted something completely different from the school. The oldest girl was really annoyed that the teachers didn't acknowledge what had happened um, and didn't talk to her about it. She felt this was disrespectful and that this is a huge thing that had happened in her life. And she'd been through that school for years and most of them didn't even acknowledge that what she'd been through. The girl who was doing the junior cert said she would have crawled under the table if the teacher had have said anything and would have been, you know, really angry if they had have raised it in front of anybody or, or made uh, an issue of it that it was private to her and she didn't want to talk about it. And the young lad um, was starting school, was very overwhelmed. It was all new to him. He was making new friends. And one of the teachers took him aside and kind of gave him a little bit of a 
a pep talk and said, if you're ever stuck or if you ever need to talk to somebody, you, you just, uh, you know, you have permission to come to talk to me anytime. And he found that really, really comforting. So that's one family, three children, and they all wanted something different from the school. So it really is a message that one size doesn't fit all. And particularly in the older age group, we have to be very respectful of, the, of what they want and respond and just talk to them personally and ask them what they what, what way they would like and um, what they acknowledge it, acknowledge what's happened, but then say, what would you like me to do? Is there anything you'd like me to do? Um, so moving on, then, I suppose there's always the, the issue of when to be concerned. And while there's lots of disruptive behavior that will emerge as reactions to grief from children because they don't necessarily have the words or they don't want to talk about it and it'll come out in lots of different behaviors. Again, as I keep saying, there's a lot of that is very normal and we just have to give them a bit of slack and a bit of support and help them find ways to express their emotions. But, and often that comes out in the, in the earlier uh, months, but over time, if the child is persistently anxious, if they're persistently aggressive or really withdrawn and not engaging with their normal activities and friends, and I don't mean in the first early stages, because it's understandable that they won't want to do that. But if they're persistent in doing that, or if they're, you know, if you feel that they're, you know, un continuing to carry the blame and the guilt themselves, um, or obviously the issues of self-harm or suicidal behaviours, then that's when um, we need to look for other supports for children. But it's really important to know that all the evidence and all the experience shows that the majority of children will learn to live and deal with their emotions around grief from the support of family, friends, and the community around them. So that's where children will get their support and that's where they'll learn how to deal with their grief. And that's where the majority of children, that's what the majority of children need. And that's why you guys are so important. And that's why parents are so important. But only a very small minority will need support externally. So I think that's often very reassuring for parents because sometimes parents will come and say, will they need counseling? Will they, should they go to talk to somebody just because they're angry or upset? And while some children may, but only a very small minority will, what they need is for the people that are close to them on a day-to-day -day basis to understand what's going on for them, to have ways to connect in with them and to be open about talking about this issue with them and letting them know that it's okay to talk. We can't fix it, we can't solve it, but we're there for them to help them deal with um, their feelings and emotions. So I'm going to wrap up shortly, but just in summary, we have to recognize that children grieve too. They grieve a little bit differently, but they grieve too. So this is some ways that we can help them. They grieve in a very personal, individual and unique way. They express it differently. They dip in and out of that grief, like I said. They understand loss in different ways as they grow. So what they've been told when they're maybe four or five about the person, their loved one dying, may need to be repeated when they're eight or nine. And some people get worried about that and they think, oh, are they regressing? Because they, we told them all this when they were four and now at eight, they're asking all these questions. All that's happening is they're understanding it in a little bit more, as they mature, they're understanding it in a more mature way. So their questions are different and they're almost sort of reliving it a little bit because now they're, they're understanding it in a more mature way. So that's normal. And often parents get really worried about that. And I find reassuring parents that that's not regression, that's normal. That's just them growing to understand it in a way and being able to ask the questions that they didn't know how to ask when they were only four. Um, so they learn how to express their emotions from family and play is a really important outlet for grief. They're hardwired to play, they will get out and play as a lot, almost like the little safety valve because I'm not gonna deal with these. This is all too hard, too upsetting. I'm gonna play and that's a great outlet for, for grief. So what helps them is compassion, warmth and connection. Instinctively, that is what 
as humans we would like to do. But for some reason, when it comes to death, we kind of are terrified. We'll, we're, we're going to do the wrong thing or say the wrong thing. So we shy away from being giving that natural compassion and warmth. But we would actively say, no, that's really what's needed. Um, children are, are helped when they're prepared for things, when they're prepared for what they might experience and what they might see. So obviously, if, they're, if it's close to an immediate death and they're attending a funeral, helping them, explaining them what's going to happen, what they're going to see. Or if, if, there's an, if somebody is dying in the family and they know that somebody is dying, explaining them what's going to happen and how that's going to happen helping them be prepared. Um, also, when they see adults that are modeling healthy grief and healthy coping, that really helps them. Now, I know that's very hard. There could be a lot of other stressors going on in the family. The family could be very upset and dealing with their own grief and emotion. But the more the family gets a bit of support for, for dealing with the grief, the better the children are going to be by default. So seeing the family and other adults talking about grief in a normal way and saying, yeah, it is upsetting. And if we cry, we cry. What's the what's the harm in us crying together? You know, that is a normal way of expressing your grief. Um, then again, what helps children is being given space to experience it and express it in their own way. That example of one size not fitting all is really important and not expecting them all. And, you know, as they journey through their grief and as they mature, they, they, at different ages, they may want to talk all about it. Other ages, they may want to shut down and not talk about it. And just respecting that. Um, giving them clear, honest, empowering and open um, language and words. Um, and, and understanding that they're not the only ones that have gone through this. So maybe connecting with other peers in the Family Resource Centre who've had a bereavement in the past and um, who who get it and know and are able to say I remember feeling like that when my dad died or I remember when my nana died you know so that can be very helpful for children and um, again giving them choices and respecting their difference the last thing I'm going to share is a really small little video which is kind of um I've I've you can use you can maybe share with families and you can share with other uh um, staff in the family resource centres. It's only a minute and a half, it's really short, and it just reiterates the message. Take a second to just play, I'll just full screen it. So that's the end. Just want to say that we're there for any of you in the family resource centers. If you want to ring us well, and talk to us, if you want to check out anything or just get a bit more information, um, we're there for you in any shape or form. We have a website, childhoodbereavement.ie. There's lots of information on the website. You can signpost parents to it. Um, you can link in with the local schools. There's a whole school section on there. 
if there's any information that you want from us or any guidance, feel free to contact us. You can contact me directly through the website, through the contact form, or um, I'll, leave, I'll send on my email details after this. Take care and the best of luck. <laughs>